let me let me start reviewing some of the things we have discussed yesterday. We have stated at least the problem we are interested in. We we want to to calculate the entanglement entropy associated to a region, okay, a spatial region. Suppose you have uh, an state, which is a quantum state, which is described by a global density matrix. Louder? Yeah. Like this? No. Yeah, oh. Okay, now it's better. Um, no? I should do like this. <laughs> no, wait, I can. You want me to try? No. Okay, now? Yes? Uh, so the idea is that if you have uh, an state which is described by this global density matrix, what you have to do is, uh, once you choose a region, this induces a partition in the global Hilbert space. So this is a complementary region. Okay, what you have to do is to trace partially trace over the degrees of freedom that lives outside the region, you get a reduced density matrix or local density matrix. And from here, you calculate the standard for Newman entropy. Okay, it's just. And this gives you the entanglement entropy associated to the region, okay? And uh, there are two points, important points here. First, you need this kind of partition of the Hilbert space. Uh, otherwise, you, you, what you get, I mean, you, it's possible to define an entropy, but it's not going to be uh, a quantum uh, entropy. It, 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 I mean, the, the, the more general expression for this has uh, another piece, a classical piece, the, the, the Shannon entropy, okay? But in this case, if you are able to, to, to do this kind of partition, then what you get is a pure quantum contribution to the entropy, okay? This is one point. Uh, another point is that if you want to give to this entropy an interpretation as a measure of uh, entanglement, you need to start with a global pure state, okay? Only in this case, uh, what you get is a good measure of entanglement. So, uh, as I, I showed you yesterday that in general, okay, any uh, density matrix can be written as the exponential of an Hermitian operator called the modular Hamiltonian. And uh, in this way, we can, uh, we can say that this entropy belongs to the same family as the standard thermodynamical entropy, okay? So today, the idea for today is to see how, how we can calculate this entanglement entropy. Okay? Even if the, the idea is quite simple, the method of calculation are very hard Usually, we have in the audience experts, Pasquale and Eric Tony, I don't know where it is. Uh, so they, they, they have done many contributions in this field. So let me start with uh, the simplest uh, calculation we can do in the lattice, okay? Where this entanglement entropy is well defined uh, it has no divergences, so uh, it's going to be uh, perhaps more, more clear, okay, the, the, the result. We can interpret the result more clearly. So yesterday, I already wrote this. We are, we are going to consider 
Gaussian systems. What I mean with uh, Gaussian systems is that we are going to, to think that uh, the weak theorem, I mean, all, all the information about the, the theory is contained in the two-point functions, okay? So, uh, in this case, the density matrix takes a particular form, okay? The, the exponential of the modular Hamiltonian is, uh, is a special. Uh, otherwise, we don't know how, how to, to do the calculation, okay? So, let's take... Um, set of variables uh, canonical commutation relations and let's put a name x to the two-point function of phi and all p the two-point function of pi and now this is our answer uh, What we are going to say is that the modular Hamiltonian in this case is going to be quadratic variables, okay? It's you can show an exercise that this form of the density matrix that all the information of the theory is in the two-point functions, okay? So you have this weak decomposition of the endpoint correlations in terms of two-point correlation functions. So now, once, uh, once you have this expression, what, what you can do is try to di diagonalize this modular Hamiltonian. I'm, I'm not going to, to give you the details of the calculation, but uh, the idea is that you can rewrite this density matrix way. These are the eigenvalues of the modular Hamiltonian produce these operators and here you need something in order to have the trace of rho equal to one, okay? So this is just for normalization and uh, okay, the idea how to go from here to here is to propose, okay, a, a Bogolyubov transformation of the variables and uh, in order to fix the, the coefficients, the free coefficients, you use uh, this, uh, I mean, you use the density matrix to calculate these uh, two-point functions, okay? So you can, you can fix the, the coefficients, the free coefficients to arrive here. And what is interesting is that what you get is a relation. You can ask me the, the details. Uh, you want to see the, the how to go from here to here. But what is interesting is that you get a relation between these eigenvalues of the modular Hamiltonian and And the eigenvalues are eigenvalues of this quantity, square root 
of x times p, okay? And why this is interesting? Because as the, the, the entropy, the entanglement entropy, of course, is given by the, can be calculated in terms of the modular Hamiltonian, then if you have a relation between the modular Hamiltonian and this quantity here, let's call it, you can rewrite Anglement entropy in terms of correlators, okay? This would be the trace of C plus one half log of C half minus log So this gives you a very strong tool to calculate the, the entanglement entropy. What you need is just to calculate correlators, okay, two-point correlators. Uh, these are going to be n times n matrices, so it's, uh, it's it's much easier to, to do the calculation in terms of, of correlators than to consider directly the calculation of the density matrix. For example, if you have a, a system of n spins, your Hilbert space will have dimensions two to the n, so you will have matrices with dimension two to the n times two to the n, so huge matrices, but in this way, you reduce your problem to n times n matrices, okay? So let me, the, of course, I, this is for scalars, but you can extend this result to fermions or also to a Maxwell field, to any dimension, okay? So it, it's, um, we have done many, many calculations using the method, and in a way, uh, okay, we are doing the calculation in the lattice, but it's the way we have to measure, okay, the entanglement entropy and to test some results that, as I will show you analytically, are very hard to, to calculate. Then uh, this tool is, is very strong to, to test if our results or, super, or, or, or our answers are true or not, okay? So let me show you some results sorry I, I, I'm sorry I don't I, I don't hear you because these correlators are restricted to your region, okay? Yes, thank you. Yes, otherwise the result you are going to get is zero. As, you are, uh, as your global state is a pure state, if you take the, the, the whole correlator, you get a zero, okay? So you have to restrict your correlator to the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, here, oh, it's, um, oh, perhaps I can see it here. Uh, okay, here we have an example uh, for a scalar field, okay, uh, a massless scalar field, and uh, what you have written there is the discrete version of the Hamiltonian. This is the real Hamiltonian, okay? It, this is not the modular Hamiltonian. And once you have uh, written your Hamiltonian in this discrete version, this is a, um, you are thinking in a two-dimensional lattice, okay? And we are interested in calculating the entanglement entropy of a square. Uh, the idea is that 
for a, for a, for a scalar field, you can prove that if your Hamiltonian, the real one, is, uh, has this form, let's say, the correlators for the vacuum state are given by this matrix here. And the restriction to the region is that these indices have to live within your region, okay? So once you have the expression for the Hamiltonian, you have to identify this K matrix here and you calculate the correlators uh, X and P. Once you have X and P, you have this, is, this, this matrix C and then you can calculate the entanglement entropy. This, this is the, the, the steps you have to follow. And what you get, the answer for, for, this, for this case, for a square, uh, you have an area term, okay, and a logarithmic correction, uh, both divergent when the lattice space goes to zero, okay? So we expect that in the continuum, we are going to have a divergent entanglement entropy. Uh, but pay, pay attention to the numbers, uh, the coefficients that we have for the area term and for the logarithmic, and let's see what happens if we uh, change a little bit our square in this way, and we see that the coefficient of the area term is the same, okay, because the perimeter of the, of the square is the same, but the coefficient of the logarithmic term has changed, okay? So you, you perhaps now it's difficult to imagine, but in the beginning we didn't know exactly uh, how, how the expansion of the entanglement entropy uh, goes. So this was the only way to, to test uh, our guessings, okay? So now we know uh, how the entanglement entropy can be expanded in, in powers of uh, the ultraviolet cutoff. But at that time, uh, we just guess. So this kind of tests were very, very important just to test what happens, for example, if your region uh, have vertices or is a smooth boundary, or I mean, you 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 can you can play with different geometries, okay, at no cost because it's it's just to to follow these these steps, okay, and uh, okay, our conclusion with this experiment, if you want, is that. Uh, the general expression for the entanglement entropy is a coefficient times the perimeter, so an area term. The coefficient of the area term is not universal. Why? Because if you, for example, uh, move uh, your square, uh, you rotate your square in this way, the, the coefficient of the area term change. So the, the area term depends on the regularization you are using, depends on the lattice you are using, okay? So this gives us, uh, uh, I mean, this, this, this gives us, uh, uh, we were sure that the area term is not universal, but the logarithmic term uh, is, is, uh, contains, uh, relevant information about our theory, okay? And uh, in this, playing with this, uh, with this uh, geometries, different geometries, what you can, you can guess is that uh, the coefficient, the logarithmic coefficient, 
has a special relation with the uh, angle uh, in the vertex. Some years later, uh, we, we were able to find exactly which is the function, this C function of the, of the, of the angle, okay? But it took us at least some years to, to arrive to the, to the right uh, answer. So, uh, let's see. Let's see now what happens in the, in the continuum. It's uh, clear that uh, that the, the entanglement entropy, uh, even if it's uh, a very interesting quantity, it has problems in the, in the continuum. Um, what we know now, is that uh, the entanglement entropy admits an expansion. In powers of, of the, let's go now, continuum. see anything as is. Let's call it epsilon. The coefficients depends on the boundary of the region. Okay. Also we have Log contribution plus a finite part. Okay? What we know now is that only the logarithmic term has a universal meaning and contains information about our theory. Uh, in general, we know that this, this expansion is true for a conformal field theory, but also if you consider for any quantum field theory, uh, the diversion part will look like this, but of course you can have corrections coming from the other dimensional parameters of the, of the theory. Uh, another thing which is interesting is that this diversion part, okay, uh, I should mention that this is known as the area law, okay, and, and this makes people to think that the entanglement entropy was a good candidate to explain uh, black hole entropy. Um, these uh, coefficients uh, depends on the boundary, uh, I mean the, 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 the contribution, uh, the, the biggest contribution to the entanglement entropy comes from the UV, so the character of these uh, of these coefficients uh, that that's why these coefficients depends only on the boundary. Okay, are local and extensive on the boundary. Are local and extensive functions of the boundary, and uh, we we know now that in this uh, in this coefficient, the logarithmic coefficient uh, has information. For example, for Depending on, on, the, on the region you consider, for example, if you take uh, um, circles or if you take, uh, in general, for spherical regions, what you get here is the anomaly of an, an, a conformal field theory. In, the, in a conformal field theory, you get the anomalies uh, that gives you uh, that tells you what is the theory you are, you are taking into account, okay? So let's see now uh, another method, now not in the lattice, in the continuum, using the, 
the replica method that was introduced, I don't know, many, many years ago for different, for different to solve different problems. It is very useful to calculate the entanglement entropy. So let's see now. The replica method. Perhaps most of you already know what is it about, but um, the idea is that the entanglement entropy can be can be calculated from what is known as the Rennie entropies. These are associated to powers of the, uh, of the density matrix. And uh, OK, let me define. are the Rennie entropies, okay? So if you take the limit and go into one, you get the entanglement entropy. Okay, the, the, you can ask yourself, okay, why uh, it's easier to calculate Rennie entropies instead of to calculate directly the entanglement entropy. The, the advantage of this is that this quantity here has an integral functional representation. So we know how to do the calc Well, we know. At least formally, we can write an expression for the traces of powers of rho, OK? And um, so for this. have a functional representation. Of course, uh, I mean, it, it's not, even if we have this functional representation, it can be very hard to calculate the Rennie entropies. But even if you succeed here, you have a, a, the second step, that is to take this limit can be very hard also. So in general, this, this calculation is, is very difficult, OK? Only in some cases and um, for some geometries, uh, you are able to, to arrive to the end, OK? Uh, so let's, uh, let, let's see how does it work. Let's start with the um, vacuum. For this, we have you know you can you can write the way functional of the vacuum. With a, with a functional integral over the lower half plane. Um, this is <coughs> normalization. This is just to normalize 
Let's write it like this. And uh, here. Euclidean action. Okay, this, this, uh, this expression comes from, in quantum mechanics, uh, the, the, the reason why we are integrating, integrating over the lower half plane, is, this is a way to select only the, the ground state, okay? Um, so, once you have this expression for the, for the vacuum, that, that's why uh, we are choosing the, the vacuum because we know how to write this expression. Now, we can write, so we are, what we have done here is to integrate, okay, we have to integrate equal zero here. We are thinking in one plus one dimensions, but of course can be done in any dimension. Um, and uh, you need the boundary condition. Y. And uh, now we can write the density matrix, just taking twice this expression, okay? What I'm doing here is just thinking phi 2 and phi 1 are the boundary conditions at equal 0. Just, okay, okay, but now, how to arrive here, yes, yes, um, Let's write it here. Suppose you, you who, who, who asked me? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, suppose you start quantum mechanics, okay? Suppose you start with this, uh, um, transition probability F final okay and then if you use the both you can rewrite this I mean, using agent states of the Hamiltonian, you can rewrite this 13. Okay, this is the, the evolution simulator. Okay, and this will be yes. And now let's. Third, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. What you get is say n here. Here also n. Okay, and you have to sum over n. And now Instead, go to the Euclidean and, and now it's clear that when 
tau goes to infinity, yes. The only, the only state that survives is the one with energy zero, okay? So the, the same thing can be done uh, in quant with quantum fields, and uh, that's why you, you have to integrate over the lower half plane, okay? This is the way to select the ground state. And, uh, Okay, once you have written your, your density matrix, the, the powers of, no, there, there's one step first. You're interested in a region, okay? So you have to trace over the degrees of freedom which are outside your region, so you have to add one integral. And what you get at the end the answer is what you have is an integral whole plane with a cut. The boundary conditions say zero plus, we call it by two or or one by one, and you approach that from below, your boundary condition is phi two, okay? So what, what you have is uh, two copies of the half plane, okay, which are glue, everywhere except along the region, okay? So you have a plane, the complete Euclidean plane with a cut along the region. And the boundary conditions, with boundary conditions, okay? Along the, uh, along your region. And, and, and now you can think what happens if you are interested in row square, well, you have simply, again, this will depend you have to take one by prime Okay, so you have two copies. You cut here, where the lower part, part of the cut is identified with the upper part of the cut in the, in the second copy, like this, okay? Now, if you want the trace for a square, you need integral. This is the way we do traces. <coughs> and what you get is just Okay. Yes. So in general, the, the representation of, of the traces of uh, powers of rho, okay, will, will be given by, by these uh, function, functional integrals. Uh, in a very complicated manifold, okay? It's, it's, uh, you have n copies, in general, n copies of the plane with uh, conical singularities 
uh, in the boundary. Okay, why why I'm, I'm saying conical singularities in the in the in the boundary? Because perhaps one way easy way to see conical singularities, if you think, for example, uh, you take one path, you fix a point, P, and uh, if you move from P, uh, let's say, have two copies, let's take rho square, and uh, move from here, and you appear immediately here in the second copy, you move here and you appear again here, okay? So let's put one, two, okay? So if, if your path uh, doesn't contain the boundary, you don't see the cut, okay, in this manifold. But, Your way from P contains the, the, let's say you go again like this, you appear here, but now I decide to do this. Then I will appear here to go back to P, I have to round boundary twice. So you have a four pi angle to go back to P. This means you have a singularity, a two pi n singularity in the boundary. So what you have to do is to calculate the partition function at the end in a very complicated manifold. Okay, and, and you don't know how to do it. I mean, there's no a systematic way to do this calculation. Um, so, um, let, me, let me show you what happens if you consider free fields. In, in the case of free fields, uh, so let, let's write the, the the result here. So uh, the traces, this is the general result. Powers. So this is the normalization. Uh, so this functional. Complicated uh, manifold. So this is something you don't know how to calculate, except for some particular cases. Okay, and then. Any entropies so this is the final result and what is difficult also is to find the continuation partition function is only defined for integer n, okay? And, and you need to take the limit n going to one. So you need to find the, the analytic continuation of this, so this is also difficult to arrive to the entanglement entropy. Hmm? But the good news Three fields are, are easier. You can map this difficult problem in a different one.
that you can solve exactly, at least for, for fermions and scalars, massive fermions, massive scalars on one segment, and if you have multi-component systems, only for fermions. So this gives you an idea of how difficult it is, in fact, to get exact results for the entanglement entropy. Uh, I, I have 10, 10 minutes more, or, or yes, yeah. no, yeah. 10, yeah. yes. Well, at, at the end, uh, you see that the, the, the important thing is that what you have is uh, these discontinuities in the boundary, okay? What happens along the cut is not going to be important at the end of the calculation. What is important is what happens in the boundary. You, you, will, you will see in, the, in, in this, example I, I will give you. I, at the end, what you need is to know what happens here, okay? These singularities are the problems, okay? The, the boundary conditions you put here, it's, I mean, it's, uh, your problem will not depend on the boundary conditions you put, you put there, okay? Yes, yes. Right. So in the case of free fields, you can map this difficult problem to another problem, which is, at, at least we know how to, how to solve. Um, the idea is the following. Let me find, I have too many papers here. Um, this one. So for free fields, so now, we are, we, are, we are changing the problem, but always difficult problems, okay? Uh, we, we start asking how to calculate entanglement entropy, so we say, okay, um, we have a method, this replica method, and instead of calculating the entanglement entropy, I will calculate a partition function in a very complicated manifold, so I don't know how to do it. So let's try now, instead of calculate the partition function, uh, we are going to map this problem to a different one. That can, this can be done for free fields only, okay? The idea is that instead of having n copies of, of the plane, what, what I'm going to do, I, I'm not going to give you the details, but the, the, at least the, the, the idea is that we are going to introduce a vector field, okay, with n components. So let's say, call it phi, like this. And now this field lives in, in one plane, okay, with, with a cat. But what we know is that in this, in this new picture, the conical singularity that appears in the original, in, in the original problem will appear, appears as Let's say uh, boundary conditions of the vector field. I mean, to, to, be, to be more precise, the, the, the problem with this vector field is that it's not going to be single value. We can introduce a matrix Uh, this matrix 
I don't know if it has sense to to write. Just to give you that has once. So this matrix, when when approaching, okay, the, the boundary, the this vector field is multiplied by this by this matrix. You see that the the work that that done. Uh, that, do, that does this, this, this matrix is to go when, from one copy to the next one, okay? That's the, this is the, the, the work that this ones, okay? And uh, you can diagonalize this problem and what you get is a set of fields that satisfy this equation. When approaching the cat from below or from above, okay? Sorry? No. No trace. No trace. You're just assuming. No. In, in, in this picture, there's no end copies. You have only one plane. And this vector field lives in one plane, a single plane, with a cat. But this field is not any more single value. This is the price, I mean, you, you, you pay. And satisfy this condition here. Yes. Have more. And there's also there's also a one here. It depends on if you are if you are dealing with fermions or scalars, you have also here like this, and uh, this is all, I believe. And the values of k for scalars calculate the values of k. scalars and for fermions, okay? So this is the, this is the answer. So what, what you obtain is n decoupled fields which satisfy this uh, funny condition, okay? And uh, in the case of fermions, you can solve this problem and, and what you get at the end is that the only thing you have to calculate using bosonization and, and, and another tools is that you have to calculate two-point uh, correlators of vertex operators uh, with this uh, given by, by, by these values of k. So you can solve exactly the problem, even if you put for, if you consider, you can solve the problem for one segment and also for multi-component uh, regions. If you put a mass, you can solve the problem exactly only for one segment. For scalars, it's more difficult. You can solve only for one segment, but you can put a mass also, okay? So, questions? Yes. Ah, here. What did you use that the, the, the fields has to be free? You said that this technique is just for free fields? Yes, the point is that, I mean, up to here, you are not using the, 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 the field is free. 
but when you want to solve this problem, I mean, this is just formally written. Then you, you, you have to solve, you have to find the, the density matrix for this, for this case. I, I didn't show you how to solve exactly, I mean, for scalars and for fermions, then you need the density matrix. We didn't do it. Okay, we, we just state the, the, the problem. And then we are going, that's why for free fermions, for example, it's easier than for scalars. I mean, this just state the problem, then you have to solve it, okay? Just so. In the replica method, uh, you mentioned that uh, this method all, uh, always it just works for the vacuum state. Uh, did I get you correctly? Well, in, in, the, in the way I, I deduce the replica method, yes, because I, I have this representation for the wave function. Uh, I, the, my question is exactly about the representation. You are constructing the wave functional of the vacuum state here, but I think in principle you can do it for any state. Of course. Yes, you're right. So in principle, the machinery works, but maybe difficulty makes you stop at some point. Of course. Mm -hmm. If you consider an ex any excited state, mm -hmm. it would work, but it would be difficult. Yes. Okay. Any other question? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. We can Thank continue. You.